thank you for joining us today. My name is Allison Hurrier and I head up the textile arts curriculum at Portland State University. Um, for those of you joining us from outside the university today, the textile arts curriculum is an elective track in the BFA program, which provides an interdisciplinary approach to clothing and textiles. We offer courses in weaving, surface design, sewn construction, and dress history that encourage students to develop portfolios for a variety of applications in fashion, costume, textiles, and contemporary art. Uh, this is one of several events that we're hosting this term where we invite students here the sewn construction class. This is our first time doing this in this hybrid format with our new OWL, so we're very excited about that. Um, so students to engage um, uh, with outside perspectives that supplement our course curriculum. So, um, And today it's um, we are in for a treat uh, because we're welcoming Alexa Stark with us um, and um, who's going to be having a conversation with our amazing guest instructor today, Fuchsia Lin in the, in the Sewn Construction class. So um, if you want to engage in upcoming programming, feel free to join our website. I'll drop that link in the chat once we uh, once we get going here. So um, before I turn things over to Fuchsia and Alexa, I would like to acknowledge that we are joining you all from Portland State University, which is located near the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, that Multnomah, Cap Flemet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of Chinook, and Tualatin Kaipuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. And remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, so I wanna go ahead and um, just introduce you all to Alexa. So Alexa Stark studied fashion, uh, fine art, and sustainable entrepreneurship through the Integrated Design Curriculum Program at the Parson New School for Design in New York City, where she launched her brand, Alexa Stark. After graduating in 2011, Alexa moved her company to Portland, Oregon, where she successfully opened three brick and mortar stores and turned her grassroots sustainable business model into an internationally recognized brand selling in the United States, Canada, France, Italy, Japan, Korea, England, and New Zealand. Uh, along with running uh, her fashion label, Alexa has her clothing and sculptural work exhibited in renowned galleries and museums, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Portland Art Museum, and the Jeff Marfa Gallery in Marfa, Texas, among many others. Uh, for those past year six years, her traveling pop-up shop everywhere, a hybrid shop gallery workshop that includes Site-specific work by international artists and designers, as well as local practitioners, has energized and supported the independent communities in Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, New York, and New York City's Ace Hotel. Um, and in 2024, we'll open within the uh, galleries of Mass MoCA. Alexa, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so thrilled to have you. <laughs> um yeah thank you thank you <laughs> we're having we're gonna have tea you're having tea with me today <laughs> cool so i'm gonna let you all kick it off fuchsia what would you like to ask okay. alexa about and alexa is there anything you want us to pull up hey um we can scroll through the website and everything um but i was just thinking we would do like a very casual um, interview type style with, with Fuchsia, um, which I'm so excited about. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm in Maine now. I don't live in Portland anymore, just to be clear. <laughs> um, but yeah, so go for it, Fuchsia, start, start the interview. Okay, welcome. And I'm making tea. Okay. Fun. I'm so excited to chat with you about your incredible journey from studying fashion design at Parsons School of Design to having your your fashion exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, you have so many inspiring stories to share. And um, so now you're, you're um, Zooming with us the other Portland in Maine. Um, however, you were based in Portland, Oregon for almost 10 years or so. And um, then you recently moved back to the East Coast where you're originally from. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your childhood and when and how you became interested in fashion design. 
Yeah, so um, I was really fortunate to have a, um, a very like art, I grew up in a very artistic family. So my dad was a, um, had an art gallery and then my mom was actually a costume and stylist, um, costume designer and stylist. And she did more like commercial work and, and film and stuff, but um, dabbled in theater as well. And so my Halloween costumes were amazing. <laughs> um, they were so fun and so good. Um, and then I was pretty like, um, I don't know, I went through some like rebel years. Um, I didn't really want to dress up. I didn't like to wear dresses. Um, I was definitely like, didn't have the vocabulary that kids have now, but I was definitely like, um, gender, I had gender dysmorphia and like struggled with uh, my identity in that way. And so I, um, I like would present in a very masculine way. And um, I also had like a, I was split between two households and things kind of got a little tricky for me and going to high school was a little tricky. So I ended up going to this boarding school in Maine. And there um, I, I ended up having, um, well, we had these like dress up dinner situations and we had formal dinner. And so we would like go and have to sit down and, and wear, um, dress up, you know? And uh, the very first one I, uh, showed up in like a three piece suit with like loafers and was like very, um, I guess mask. And, uh, and I like showed up and like all the other girls were in these like dresses and they were like, a lot of them had more money than me and like my family. And so they were wearing Lily Pulitzer and Ralph Lauren cause it's also like a boarding preppy boarding school in Maine. Um, and I like, I felt like just really out of place and I just went and I cried in the bathroom. Um, I was like, felt, I just didn't know what to do. I just was really panicky. And so, um, this girl came in, uh, and found me crying and like, was like, all right, well, like, you know, what's wrong? And then ended up like kind of redoing my outfit and I went out there a little bit more confident and then she was like you know next time come over to my room and we'll get you set up and so before dress up dinner I head over to her room and um she like put this outfit on me and then it like didn't quite fit so then she just took scissors and like cut it up on my body and I was like whoa that's crazy and she was like yeah, it's like, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Just like, have fun with it, make, like, make it work and like, make it, make the clothes work for you. And, um, and then, so I went to that dress up dinner and then um, the following week, we ended up going to this thrift store and it was this thrift store where you could buy like a whole trash bag full of clothes. And she, we like filled the clothes up and then like went back and reworked the clothes and, and started making all these outfits. And that's when I started making clothes. I was just like taking apart old clothes and putting them together. And I didn't really know how to sew. So a lot of it was sewn with like dental floss. Some was like duct tape together. There was a lot of like tying and like tearing apart things and all that stuff. So I was just making these outfits and and I ended up giving myself this challenge of making a new outfit every week. So I would never have to like make, or never wore the same outfit uh, twice. And my teacher essentially like saw that and was like seeing me make these, my art teacher and seeing me making these, all these outfits. So when it was time to go to college, I wanted to go to school for photography and my um, people were like, no, you're a fashion designer. And I was like, really anti that. 
And so I didn't really quite understand um, what that, like, I just didn't get it, but turns out I was, and I am. <laughs> um, so I ended up going to Parsons, studying fashion, and um, I really hated it. <laughs> I hated the program, it was too rigid. Um, and it didn't, I wasn't interested in the people because like I was, I kind of still had that like punky vibe and in, in like 2007, um, it was like the height of, um, I guess like uh, Alexander McQueen, which is punk and cool, um, but the like girls were wearing like these platform heels that were like giant and like mini skirts and and it was really competitive and and I didn't I wasn't down for that and so I ended up finding this program um, called integrated design curriculum and um, it was kind of like a mix of like entrepreneurship courses and I can choose like many different majors uh, and mediums and it all had to be like presented under the umbrella of sustainability. So I chose mm -hmm. fine arts, fashion and communication design. And that's like how I kind of got into this like more sustainable practice and like really started designing outside of the box. And I no longer felt trapped by this idea that I needed to like graduate and then like work for the a company for five years and then, you know, work for, uh, like go into that fashion system. So it really like liberated me and like helped me continue being like this like punk person, I guess. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Did I do that right? <laughs> yes, thank you for hearing about that. So when you were studying at part the, the program you studied at sounds so interesting. Um, I was wondering, what were some of the most important lessons you learned at Parsons? And how did you feel like your teachers really encouraged you to really uh, follow your own path? Yeah, I had um, an amazing teacher named Pascal Gatson, who was my, um, she was from Holland and she was my mentor. And um, teacher and I ended up working for her. Um, she, uh, incredible person. She really encouraged me to like not worry about um, construction. Sorry, I shouldn't be saying this in your construction class, but <laughs> to like, you know, know the, know the basics, but like, she really was like, it's like 10% skill and like, 90% heart and like to just like put yourself out there just keep putting out like nothing's precious as well like I remember we were going to some some I can't remember I guess we were at MoMA and like we were doing a photo shoot as a class at the at MoMA and the security guard wouldn't let one of my classmates in because his clothes were made out of um, like plastic, like hard plastic. And so he was wearing like this, like very structural hard plastic outfit and um, the security guard wouldn't let him in. And she was like, but it's clothes, it's just clothes. like." It's just like the like it can be like she was just like these are close like she really believed that like anything that you put on your body is clothes and I like I just like it just like my brain was like exploded with like wow the possibilities the endless possibilities mm -hmm. and then also like I kind of think about like um I like interpreted it in another way where it's like it's just clothes like you just like you make it you put it out there and like it can mean so much but it also could be like just clothes um I don't know I just I thought that was great um but yeah so she really encouraged me to like just start making clothes and 
and not be afraid to like present myself because I think a lot of times we get caught up in like perfection and making something perfect before we present it to the world Mm -hmm. and it I don't think it's a I don't really think it's about that like I don't think you like that just like stops you from performing to for stops you from putting your work out there and just like being yourself and Mm -hmm. um and it's like you have to let that go you have to just do the work and let it put it out there and let it go and let people interpret it the way they want you know nothing's Mm -hmm. that precious you know so you really broke out (laughs) of this Mm -hmm. I'm sorry you really broke out of this like conceived box of like how you need to be going on this following the this certain path in order to become a fashion designer um so you yeah. actually started selling your work before you graduated from Carson right yeah so when um so in this program um I think like it was our senior year I can't quite remember if it was our junior year or senior year, and one of the requirements was um we had to put it out there in the world so mm-hmm if you were like a painter and that was like painting was your medium, you would have to like figure out how to like display your artwork. And I was in, my main thing was clothing design. So I ended up doing this flea market called Artists and Flea in Brooklyn. And I just like set up a rack and it was all like deconstructed, reconstructed clothing. I had to like come up with a branding, I had to, I bought my website <laughs> um, and I just started selling clothes and that was like amazing because like I sold clothes and it mm-hmm. was like so empowering I was like oh my god like people want to wear this stuff and like um, at that age I was also you know very stubborn about construction and or not construction but like valuing my work um, and maybe a little naive where I was like, well, it took me like, you know, nine hours. And so therefore this dress has to be like a thousand dollars or whatever. And I didn't quite like understand, like now my prices have like, they've like changed and there's some that are really high end and some are like, uh, the cost is lower and everything. But I remember like selling like a $500 dress on like the sidewalk. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like it worked. <laughs> like people bought this, this is crazy. Um, and so I, it, yeah, it just like gave me a lot of confidence to continue and, and like realize that if you just put it out there, this is like before social media too. So this is like, there's no, Instagram to promote it was just like going out in the street and being like here I am and people just like walk by and bought stuff it's crazy um yeah so that like gave me a lot of confidence and allowed me to like in a naive way move to Portland after graduating and and then I was like I'm gonna open a store (laughs) and people are gonna walk in (laughs) it's crazy Um, yeah it's crazy like yeah um and I could speak to that later if you want but that was funny (laughs) kind of worked yeah well actually that was going to be my next question because you really stayed true and authentic to yourself your path that you wanted to follow and so you chose not to do like the conventional route of interning for a fashion design house and then working there for several years before launching your own line. You just went for it. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit of like, what were the pros and cons of going about um, launching your fashion design label? Like um, just right, um, yeah, just uh, in your own way. Yeah, so what ended up happening is I, moved to Portland, Oregon, kind of um, on a whim. I drove across the country. I had a a residency that I was going to do in Maine after graduating. And I sort of like deferred it. 
And then I drove across the country and then um, I ended up getting sick and started like, I decided to stay in Portland a little bit longer because one of my best friends was there. And then I was just about to drive back to the East Coast when the residency called me and they were like, we had some issues and we ended up having to shut down. So I was like, oh, what am I gonna do with my life? <laughs> um, so I started working for, um, I got a job at Buffalo Exchange. I got a job working for a thrift store, which is now closed. And I cannot even remember the name of it. Um, the factory, I think it was called. And um, I started reworking clothes and selling them at the factory. And it just like, they were selling. So I was like, well, maybe I should look into opening up my own shop. So I found a live work space on Alberta and um, put, I lived, I had curtains up, which you should actually post that picture. My curtains were these like <laughs> American flags, which is like such a triggering image. <laughs> now I like to look at that and I was like, oh my gosh, like this, <laughs> this might be a little intense for people now. But um, at the time I was like really into the, like, like being a, like a, an American designer. And so, um, and like, cause I, my favorite designers were like Claire McArdle and, um, yeah, I was just really into like American made clothes, Levi's, you know, um, upcycling denim was like huge for me. So I ended up, um, yeah, I had my store in the front and then behind that curtain was my kitchen and my bedroom. And, um, and it was like, great. And I opened up and nobody came in. <laughs> um, and so that, I mean, like it was, farce because I didn't have nobody knew who I was you know um and things started people started buying things but not really I had to like have a lot of events like introduce myself to the world essentially if I got an Instagram I was very stubborn because it came out and I was like what is this Instagram thing and then I got it and then um, I used filters, which was crazy. Um, and then I, um, yeah, and then I ended up partnering with another store named Backtalk. Um, and I, we ended up splitting that space and we, I, I, I moved my shop to, um, Mississippi with Backtalk, Mississippi Avenue. And, um, yeah, and then I, like started to having to cater towards more of like I was doing more like higher end clothing and then I was like oh this isn't selling in Portland so I had to like cater and change my designs to like be more um, affordable wearable all this stuff for the Portland customer and that whole experience was such a learning like I had a learning curve like that was I you know then having to do production on my all by myself and I was still doing everything on like a home sewing machine um and because I was like afraid of industrial machines so learn an industrial machine um <laughs> yeah and I um I like wasted so much money and time and all that stuff just like not really knowing what I was doing but at the same time I was free like I sometimes look back and regret like not working for another company first because I would have like learned so much about the industry and how it ran but then at the same time I look back and I'm like those first four years of of owning my own business was like kind of like going to grad school and I was just mm -hmm. like making mistakes learning so much and like spending money to to do that and I um I didn't have any money really. So it was like sale to sale. And I remember like one winter I like, I got really sick because I was eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every meal. <laughs> and like, you know, I was just like so broke. And so like, yeah, there's the cons of like, you don't make any money to start unless you have a lot of money to invest. Um, and so like working for somebody, you get a steady paycheck, 
you could start like designing things on the side. But for my friends who have went that route, they got more comfortable getting we having weekends, more comfortable mm -hmm. not working as much, um, you know, and then like their time spent out side of work they didn't want to work anymore they didn't want to put that energy into like making clothes because they were already like designing for somebody else or something so mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know like I I sometimes I'm like I wish I did that and then sometimes I'm like I'm so glad I didn't I, I yeah and I am I'm so glad I didn't really ultimately in the end but it's just like there were some really hard hard times <laughs> and like I made a lot of mistakes so um I think that maybe like the generation that I'm speaking to right now probably has a higher chance of success because there are so many um outlets like it, Instagram and Facebook if that's still people are still using that and um TikTok to like promote yourself so it's a whole different world um yeah now there's online sales and everything so it was just different, but um, so it might be a little bit easier to start your own brand. I mean, I now I've had interns that like started their own brand in high school. So uh, it's like a whole thing now. Um, but yeah, and yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> yeah, well, Ash, I really understand all the sacrifices you have to make to just do your be doing your own thing and um, doing your art so really inspiring to hear your sharing your experience um, so again following this unconventional route it's given you like all this creative freedom to collaborate with all different artists and to create your own collections inspired by what you are inspired by and also to really choose this path of sustainability in your work all things that I really admire about your work uh, I'd love to have you share a little bit of your inspiration from your work because I um I remember one story about your grandfather telling you this story and and then also um yeah, just seeing your grandmother wear your clothes um, was really, really sweet to see how your your clothing um, creations are really accessible to any age, any gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it started, I started out to be, I, I started out making women's wear. Um, and when I was at Parsons, I was really interested in um, American designer um, and like femininity and uh, like that definition. And my um, stepmom was a, it is a very feminine person, but also is like a boss, a boss B. And um, <laughs> she's amazing. Um, and she um, she was a huge inspiration for me. And she like she loved the like 1950s cut. She loves that cut. Um, and so I started kind of designing with her in mind. Like I want to design a, for a woman who loves, who finds themselves, finds strength in their femininity and like, and um, and that's when I started pairing like those cuts with denim and um, and making like these really femme dresses, but out of like this really like durable um, utilitarian material. And um, so it, that kind of it started with that. And then um, after, moving to Portland and kind of getting to like um, sort of out of the high end like world or a thought of being in that world and getting more like casual um, and selling to the Portland market more I was like okay let's like think about what body like the body types that are like walking in here and I started selling to a lot of 
I noticed that the women who bought my clothes were mostly women um, uh, over 40 and like their body was changing or had changed and, um, but they still wanted to feel confident and sexy. And then, um, and then I started like a lot of um, male identifying people would come in and start like wanting clothing that were fitting their body. And so then I just started slowly being like, fuck, like, what, sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, I was like, oh God. I'm like, 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 what, like, kind of going back to like who I was as a kid, being like, why is there gender? Like, this is like, this is like, and I just, in this was like in 2014, I was like, this is dumb. Like, fashion should not be gendered. And so I started making like, like, going, be, like, blurring the lines and really. And then, then I started showing collection and I got really confused. Like, I, like, do I sell during men's fashion week or do I sell during women's fashion week? And so then I kind of like would, I was selling in women's because that was that schedule. I was already on that schedule. And, and so I was like, all right, I'll just do that. But I was shooting on both. Um, male identifying bodies and female identifying bodies and then um, I would just send my collection um, like line sheet and lookbook to uh, like menswear stores as well so it started to become more fluid um, that way um, and also like I was shooting on models of all different ages because like my grandma was like really into my clothes and I was like all right grandma like let's do this thing and um <laughs> yeah and I just like I just kind of it all just sort of naturally flew out of me um and I like started working with um high school students from Portland and that was like really the age range of people who were really like starting to like be more confident about their gender identity like um and I had a couple of interns that were just like you know I guess would be they them or are they them now but like at that time that still that wasn't really a language that had developed and so mm -hmm. um there was a lot of like conversation and um yeah it was it was awesome to like kind of go through that and then see it happening in fashion and all like it was just like oh my gosh like like this is like what a beautiful thing to see watch happen and and it like I feel like gender identity um was really like in independent design was really the uh, the first art form to really like show and express that um uh sort of you know, whatever change in society so that was cool yeah yeah I feel mm -hmm. like artists are always the ones who are pushing the boundaries because we're part of the struggle mm -hmm. totally and like I mean you read about like history a uh, history about artists and like you're finding out that like a lot of people were like cross-dressing or like between blurred like gender identities and like, you know, it was just like illegal back in the day or something, but it's like totally <laughs> like it was had to be hidden, but now like all these stories are coming out like, oh yeah, like, they were queer. So that was cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you share the story about your grandfather, the story that he told you about um, starting from like the Big Bang and um, why it's like, such a beautiful thing that we're all here? <laughs> or maybe I just already told the story. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you kind of did. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, grand my grandfather, we were talking about politics I think it was like right after Trump was elected and like we were all depressed and um 
he was like talking about uh, how like the big bang happened and um, it was like sort of a freak accident in a way and and um, and from that earth formed and life formed and like human life formed and um and the fact that we're even here is just like insanely like rare and so like our time on earth and our time like humanity is so like special and like why does it why are we like you know fighting all the time essentially when we should be like whoa this is amazing um and this is like I'm talking about this is like a short version of this this is like a very long conversation it was amazing and um and it made me and then he said um uh like I can't remember how it led up to it but beautiful because we're here um and I just thought that was like such a amazing perspective and and line. And so I like, that was my first collection of like, um, like, like all bodies, all, all gender collection, um, because it is true. It's like, we're all so beautiful and or it's like great that we're all here and like it we like the chance of us being here is just like so little so just like lean in <laughs> to love or whatever so yeah that's that story um yeah beautiful beautiful story well i <laughs> i would love to have you just share more about your materials that you use for your collection. You're very selective and very conscious about the materials, the sustainable materials um, you use, especially denim is, um, is a fabric that you're really drawn to. Could you share a little bit more about your relationship with denim? Sure, yeah. Um, so denim to me is like, again, like I was obsessed with American uh, fashion and denim um denim is not in america it's not um it was in it was first made in denim france um and um brought over like basically america one of like our big industry things was is cotton right um so this is questionable all this is you know whatever but um I uh George Washington basically was like like when the mills stopped running after you know, during the war and whatever and when he became elected he like got all the denim mills working again and um and like actually all the clothes that you see that's like blue and like those historical paintings it's actually called denim um and it's so it's just like a very american it became a very americanized fabric um and then levi's came out and it's like american workwear right it was for um everybody was wearing it and then in the 50s um elvis wore it to like the Grammys or something. And everyone was like, holy sh Nikes, like that's like um, workwear, Whoop, lost my thing. Um, and like, then it became glamorized and then like, you know, fast forward to the, the 70s, 60s and it became like, like the hippies were modifying it and um, it became like the fabric of like freedom. And then uh, it's like, um, and then we like made it sexy with Calvin Klein. And it's just like, it's just has this like amazing history in America is like, you know, dress up, dress down. Um, it became a very class neutral material. 
Um, and so that was cool. And then I found that interesting, but I also found out, or just like researching the fabric itself, it's like super durable and super um, like anti, it, you could wear it like a million times and it like doesn't get that gross actually. Um, so I thought about that. And then like, I started thinking about the history of clothing, like in its lifespan, like getting like the cotton was picked, it was spun, it was then, you know, turned into like woven and then it was cut and made into pants and then someone wore them. And then like, by the time I would get that, that pair of pants to rework, it already lived like so many lives and the previous owner, like blood, sweat, tears went into it. And mm -hmm. it just like had so much history in it mm -hmm. already. So like, I was really drawn to like cutting that up and like giving it a new life. Um, that's my love of denim story. <laughs> really all drawn out. Um, and then, yeah, and I just like got into reworking clothes only at first. And then I realized that that wasn't really a sustainable business model because um, at that time, people weren't appreciating the upcycle as much. So it was like, people would be like, so like you're making new clothes and old clothes, that's gross or whatever. And then like, why is it this much money? And so I was met with some challenges. So then I was like, all right, we'll start like using dead stock fabric, but that wasn't really a thing yet. So I was literally like dumpster diving <laughs> at factories. So I would go up to Seattle and dumpster dive their like Filson. Oh and get fabric from them mm -hmm. um, because a lot of factories back then would or businesses back then would like after they would use up a roll but if they can't mm -hmm. like cut do a full cut out of that roll of fabric they'll throw out like 10 yards and they would literally just put them in the dump so I would go there and then I started approaching companies and being like hey can I buy your fabric from you or can I just take it? And a lot of times they were just like, just take it, just take it. So I was getting a lot of this like free, amazing fabric. I still have a roll of Filson wax canvas that I dumpster dive for that I like won't use because it's like, it just is like my personal, like I fought for this, <laughs> I did this um, memory. Uh, and yeah, and then like, it started to become a trend and I was working with Eileen Fisher, um, their Renew program and work, reworking, they were giving me clothes to rework and they were like, I was helping them sort of figure out how to disassemble and reassemble in a sustainable way. And um, that sustainable fashion is a challenge. You can't really upscale um, from that. Um, and that got hard for me. That was like kind of the, I was like a little defeated in terms of like, like how do I grow my business? And then, I mean, I basically decided just to not do that. I just was like, wait, the fashion industry wants me to be like, wants me to produce, you know, like a thousand plus garments per style or whatever and mass mm -hmm. produce and get it out there. And like the only way to do that is to like use new material. And mm -hmm. then like looking at, then I did, you know, research into new materials and realizing that there were so many things that you don't know. Like at one point, it's changed since then, but you could sell organic cotton fabric, but the law in the country that it was made in is that you only need 10% of that cotton to be co organic and you could still call it organic cotton. So there were all these like weird loopholes in like 
production of fabric that was like you're not actually getting organic cotton yeah. or you're not actually getting organic hemp or whatever and so I was like ah this is just as poisonous and deadly and or the fabric is maybe a hundred percent organic but they're using these dyes that are like so so toxic so like really for me I was like okay then I'll forget about organic stuff and just think about trash or like what is considered trash and just like do dead stock material. But then like dead stock material is still limited because you only get, you know, maybe a hundred yards of something and then you don't have it again. And so you can't make it. So I was like, all right, so I have to keep like, I had my, like my plan of being like a huge thing business and up, up and scaling up was like okay now my collections are getting smaller and smaller and then I was like you know what I'm just gonna make one <laughs> and like I also like would go through production and everything and I would like I mean working with Portland Garment Factory was like an amazing experience they taught me so much and like I highly suggest working with them um and they've grown a lot since I started working with them too but um, they let me do like smaller runs and they um, they walked me through the whole process because I never thought I was going to be upscaling. Um, but the um, but even still, like for me, like as an artist, I would like design one and then I'd get, you know, the order and they'd make they would make something they would make it. And I remember getting it back from them and being like, really, this is what I made? Like, this, it felt like dead because it wasn't like, I didn't make it myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there was like the artist in me like felt sad and dead um, because I wasn't actually like poking my fingers with, with <laughs> needles and like getting that, like I wasn't like my tears weren't in the, like the clothes that I was making. Um, so yeah, so that was, I had to, I had to make a decision and I decided to go the more like artist route. Um, yeah. So that's what I did. Are you going to do one more question before we like yeah. open it out? Yeah. 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 So cool. after this, this really fascinating journey, last year you had your piece exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Costume Institute in the show called In America, A Lexicon of Fashion. And this is every fashion designer dream to have their work exhibited at the Met. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about the exhibit, your piece, and how this opportunity came about. Um, sure. Uh, I got an email and I was like, is this scam? <laughs> Is this a scam? Um, and turns out it was. And I like Googled who the email was from. I was like, oh, this is actually the curator of the collection. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't really know how it happened. I like asked a million people that I knew that were somewhat related or connected, including someone who is a assistant um, curator at the Met. And she was like, oh, the head guy has been talking about you for years and I didn't tell him about him. And I was like, whoa, cool. Um, so I don't know. I think like just putting my work out there for all of these years has like, you know, brought attention to it. Um, and then also my, like what I didn't touch on is that over, so once I started just, decided to just do like one of kinds, one of kind pieces, I really realized that the most sustainable process is teaching because like, you should just know how to like mend your own clothes and make your own clothes. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. like, um, so you're not buying more stuff and all that stuff. So, so that like, I think that story maybe, I don't really know, brought attention to like my my work as like a sustainable designer. Um, I would say like, I, I wouldn't say I was the first generation of art of designers to be doing the work that I'm doing, but I was part of a group of people who started doing it at the time when we, like all of our attention 
as like in America or like gl internationally globally was like oh we're like we're killing the planet so things shifted I just was happened to be there at the right time time and place mm -hmm. um that experience was really cool I like went to the met and I like saw it and I was like whoa and like cried of course um yeah and I I also had this moment where I was like well what now like that was like a goal in life and I'm like 33 um uh, 32 at that moment and I was like now what do I do like what do I focus on now like if I've, I've already made it there and really like it was cool for me and it was like really cool for like a you know something to that just happened but like that doesn't mean that my, my work is done you know I just have to keep making clothes and um and being like yeah just part of the whole just yeah keep doing it keep teaching keep making keep living yeah so that's that's one oh. <laughs> well, congratulations again really so well deserved so um I would love to have you keep it very like what's happening now for you and also I want to open up um this chat with some yeah. students who might have some question or some of our audience members does anyone have sure. any questions you'd like to ask Alexa if not, I have I have some questions. I have a lot more questions. <laughs> okay, I have. Um, um, oh, first of all, can you hear? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I can hear. Here. Let's just yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for a student wanting to break into the professional art world? Um, and what should we be focusing on now while we're in school in order to like set ourselves up to try to do that? Professional right. art yeah. world. So not necessarily fashion, but like art in, in at large. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, my advice is uh um learn uh foundation learn um I definitely like when I after I graduated and I started making clothes and at, like I was you know like I said my teacher was like don't worry about construction just like whatever um I had to like kind of reteach myself how to sew <laughs> and I like would go to modern domestic and be like how do I do this and the ladies there were like okay this is how you put a zipper in or whatever um so that was rad uh but like I like like construction and um, foundation is really, I think, important. Um, it also, I feel like maybe you're not you're maybe you're not going to be good at it. Maybe you can't like draw the an egg perfectly or a pine cone perfectly or whatever or bicycle or whatever those requirements are. Um, but like training your brain to do your training your hand to do as close to like what your brain sees is just so important and then from there you get weird from there you start bringing in your life and your your experiences and your creativity and like you you are able to really express I just feel like you're able to express yourself when you know how to do like the basic thing um because sometimes I feel like my like it's a fallback to be like well I wasn't really trying to draw that perfectly like this is a like abstract and because you know but like I don't know I feel like we've lost we've lost so much in a, in society like with um technology and stuff that like we just have like I don't think people even know how to do cursive anymore and it's just so important to just like know how to do that like hands-on stuff um so that's one thing um talk to your peers talk to your teachers get to know the people in your community who are making art like really connect with people because um your peers will be 
someone else in the art world and mm -hmm. you're gonna wanna collaborate with them later. Um, you know, hang out with older artists, intern. Um, I know interning is questionable because like it's like free labor and all that stuff but like I interned for free for like four years and I learned so much and and it's just like you need to like get these experiences and and I there's no I think there's no I I think like interning and um whatever um being a like an artist assistant is just you're gonna learn so much um Yes, get you to eating a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, I yeah, no, um, that's what I suggest, I guess. If I hopefully yes. I answered the question. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, it's very helpful. Yeah. We probably have time for two more questions. Anybody in the room or online? Um, yeah. um I'm curious more about your experience at Parsons or if there is like, do you have any other schools that you feel are really, um, I know that the new school has like that, that uh, curriculum, like you were saying, like where you can build your own um, mm -hmm. interdisciplinary, like, do you know of other programs that are like that? Do you really um, do you feel like that's like a great way, like a, uh, like having a more, uh, I, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it. I, I'm, I'm just, more, I'm more curious just like how, how you feel about the schooling that, that you've gone through and if there's. Uh, yeah, option. so that. Oh, I, I think we, we finished the question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the last part of your question broke up. I think it was, um, it was thinking about school and just like formal education structures, I think, and like um, what your experience was like just building your own independent kind of way in that with this program at Parsons and maybe if there's other sure. schools yeah, yeah mm -hmm, that you would recommend. Sure. Uh, I um, <laughs> I I love that program. It had a lot of flaws. Um, like I was telling Fuchsia yesterday that there was like two two types of students in that program. There was like the overachievers, which is kind of me, and then there was also like the super super lazy people because they were like, oh, well, I'm just gonna like I can build my own curriculum, so I'm gonna take like four classes or whatever. And I was like, I'm gonna take 18 classes. Um, which, uh, yeah, uh, it's true. Um, and so uh, they ended up changing that program to a grad program, I think. Um, and then I don't know of any other programs uh, at schools um, like that. But I think that like, going to a specific school like Parsons that has like this really intense fashion program versus going to a like a um like uh I don't know a smaller school or that has like like Kent or something that has or PSU with a fashion thing it doesn't really matter um it's all about how much work you put in and how hard you're gonna like you're gonna work you know and um I think it's like yeah maybe um maybe you are um maybe you have like I don't know how many credits are required now but like you can always like take you can always see, talk to your advisor and see if you could sit in all their classes um I think there's like, there's so many, the college is like, you have all these resources, you just have to use them. Like, I wish that I had went to like every lecture at Parsons because like, I was like, oh, I should have like ugh, focused more. And I, 
yeah, I think it's just, it's what you make out of it. And, you know, your teachers are there to help um, you get to the next place. And, yeah. um, and then if you graduate and you feel like you need more, like there are MFA programs that are really great. I know Brown has an amazing MFA program. It's, it's like the digital, um, I think it's called digital something. I can't remember. It's really weird because you think it's going to be like tech based, but it's not, it's like a build your own, um, curriculum type thing. And like Brown is like the, one of the, I think the like most open sort of like weirdo school <laughs> in the country, <laughs> like that is like a, you know, big school, but, um, yeah, that's the only MFA program I can think about that's like, that's similar to what I was doing in undergrad. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. But just, just work hard. <laughs> okay. Do you want to take a fun Keisha, so you want some critique? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I just want to um, have you share with the students, like, the project that you're working on with your, uh, your in and where your next direction is going uh, as an extension of your Alexa Spark label. Sure. So, um, so uh, let's see, like 2018, I started doing this pop-up shop thing. I turned my shop that was just like Alexa Stark or whatever into a collective. And we, it was called Everywhere Space. And I think we had, or everywhere. And we had like eight people invo involved. And then COVID hit and that turned into a pop-up space. Um, and like, it kind of, collective sort of dwindled because then I was like, well, I want to move. And so um, it became like a kind of like a solo project, which I, I hate saying, but it sort of did. And um, and so I would like team up with a couple of people like we did one in New York and that was with um, I did it in collaboration with one of the original collective members, Alec Mar Marchant. Um, and then, um, and then I did it in Maine this past summer with a new friend of mine and she was an interior designer. And so this like idea of like bringing, like, I also really like the idea of bringing artists together and like lifting each other up. Like that's another way of like sustainability, I think, because, you know, if like artists and and fashion designers specifically, if you compete within your own like independent fashion level and you are like knocking each other out at the knees and like stealing ideas and doing all this stuff, it's kind of like really messed up to me because um, we're actually supposed to unite to fight like huge corporations <laughs> and not like, we have to like support each other right um so that like idea of like working with more people and collaborating and sort of like helping like I was like I have some clout I guess and so I was like all right if I help this person who needs more visibility like they get more like I get a friend I get like it was also like I was lonely in my studio I just like wanted to like bring in more people um so that kind of started this idea of like bringing in, creating a home for artists to be in. Um, and then I moved to Maine and this house came up that used to be in an inn back in the day. And I'm all about preservation. And it was this old house that um, like was on Main Street and um, I contacted, or I, like a friend was visiting me um, from Portland, Oregon, actually, who is like also into like home preservation. And mm -hmm. like, he saw the house and we were like, oh my gosh, like what, it, what could this be? And I was like, okay, it could be like um, a school, a factory, blah, blah, blah. And then like, I was just trying to go through all these ideas. And then I was like, or an inn that could be like 
um, a place where we have put a lot of like artist work and maybe we have like an artist residency or maybe we have like all this, um, uh, we have, um, you know, everything's handmade, like all this stuff. So that kind of like became my new project. Mm -hmm. And then like thinking about, I was like, all right, Alexa Stark home. Cause I also, when I started doing the, the pop-ups, I started um, my metal work. I don't know if you know about this Tisha, but I was like, um, also I learned how to weld and I was like making clothing racks. And then like, I was also making furniture for the shop. So I just was like, all right, let's like this house, we can, or the inn can be like, I can make things and, uh-huh. and like, I have to make bathrobes and I'll make one of a kind bathrooms and then we'll sell the bathrobes. And it just became this whole like, yeah experience or whatever sorry I'm trying to say this as fast as I can (laughs) but yeah so it was um it's just like the next level and then I'm still like showing collection like I'll be in New York about to show collection I I basically like ironically even though I call myself an American designer or whatever I like now mostly just only sell in Japan (laughs) um so uh (laughs) I'm showing collection and I, I'll never stop making clothes and I'll never stop making, um, like I, I will probably always be part of the fashion industry, but I'm just going to do it my own way. Yep. And like that, yeah. <laughs> um, also part of the in process was like making, you know, money <laughs> so I could, <laughs> continue making like one of a kind pieces and like showing them in galleries and stuff so yeah that's yeah. so exciting and all um, of us okay that's it thank you that's so exciting um, can... if any... oh I just want to say that's so exciting we can all follow your journey on Instagram at Alexa Stark and see how your project is evolving um, thank you so much for um, for being here and chatting with mm-hmm. us. It was such a treat to hear about your journey. And I'm really so grateful for you to spend time with us today. So I'm wishing you the best of luck and definitely want to stay in touch with you. Yeah, th- thank oh, you so amazing. much for joining yeah. us. You're getting all sorts of love in the chat and in the room. It's certainly, I can, I can tell that uh, as you were talking, I could see everybody sort of nodding and, and really sort of understanding what you were saying. And um, and really just, um, I think that doing it your own way sort of spirit that you were talking about at the end is, is, is really, I think, a model that we try to embrace here. So thank you for uh, showing us that that can be a successful, uh, a successful path and journey. So um, cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to just close us out formally and just um, let everybody know that this will be up on the archive for you all in the room and whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, that link will be up uh, later this week and I will share in the archive link also just um, Alexa's Instagram and website and um, any other links that we feel like would be helpful for you all. So um, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording for folks that are uh, joining us online. And thank you so much for Thanks, coming. Alexa. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>